Revelation chapter 6. Revelation 6. Alright, as we study in Revelation, we recognize that there's this message that's going out to the children of God about persecution and suffering that is sweeping through the empire. And they're given a behind the scenes look as to why that's happening, why it's taking place. And it's essentially talking about God punishing those who are the enemies of His people and the enemies of His cause. And so the things that were unfolding in the empire were not just random events. They weren't just things that were occurring solely on the actions, the ideas of men, but it was God's hand that was working these things out. And we want to remember the same God that was alive and working then is alive and working now. As we read through these things, we will see some similarities to what is going on in our world today. But we want to remember that what's written here was written to the audience who first received this letter, to those who were among the seven churches of Asia, to Christians who were contemporary at that time in the first century. So we look now, Revelation chapter 6, we're picking up with the fifth seal. We looked at the first four seals that were on this scroll that was written inside and out. The one who was worthy to unseal it, the one who was worthy to open it, was the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Lamb of God. And he's opened up those first four seals, and with each of those first four, you had a horseman sitting on a horse of a particular color. And as those horsemen went out, there was essentially war, death, destruction, suffering going along with that. And so we pick up now with the fifth seal as he opens that up and we see then what unfolds as it's open. So let's read Revelation 6 verses 9 through 11. Who will grab that for us? Go ahead, Hank. When you open the fifth seal, I saw under the altar, the soul is open the and it's like for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And then he cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord? Holy and true, since as we judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth. And then a white robe was given to each of them. And it was said to them that they should rest a while, a little while longer, until both the number of their fellow servants and their brother who would be killed as they were as completed. Okay. So question number four, I asked, what were the souls under the altar told and why? To rest a little while longer. They wait for the others. What what's the altar a symbol of here? What what is the what is an altar? Exactly. It's a place of sacrifice. So here are those who have sacrificed themselves for the Lord. That's the idea. And what's their pride to the Lord? How long? Till what? To avenge, avenge our blood. So they're crying out to God for justice. What's happening to us is wrong. There are people who are persecuting us, causing us to suffer, and they had died for the cause of the Lord. So, how long? How long, Lord, are you going to let this go on? This isn't the first time in the history of God's people that they've cried out, like, how long are you going to let this happen? Um, we have one perspective of what should unfold and when it should happen, and God has a different perspective. And we have to trust in Him and His timeline on things. So they cry out, and the Lord's response again 
is wait. Wait. Why, why are they waiting? What's that? Waiting for the others. For the others what? Fellow servants. Sons. Unless you were persevered. Right. The way they were persecuted. The killed. killed. There are yet more who are to be killed. What's he saying in this? The, the, the turmoil is not over yet. There is more. It's not over. What else? Let me ask you something. Uh, we just recently had the national holiday Memorial Day. What, what's the point and purpose of Memorial Day? Remember those who sacrificed their life for our country. They went to war. They went out there into danger. And they lost their lives because of that. Defending a cause. The cause of freedom. The cause of democracy. Right? And we honor them. What about these people? What cause could you give your life for that's greater than the cause of Christ? What greater honor could someone have? And the Lord is telling there's others who are going to receive this same honor. There are others who are going to live up to this greatness. Just like you did. You lived. You were faithful. You were true. You gave your life in this cause. And now they're as this picture here, they're at the altar of God. They're before God. He said there's others who are going to make that journey too. There are others who are going to give their lives. So there's time that needs to be given here for that to unfold and that to take place. So we understand in this that suffering and hardship are good. I was going to say, Stephen, in what you note here, their honor was recognized by God because they were given a white robe. Exactly. Here they are with the white robe, which symbolizes what? They're pure before God. They're clean. They're innocent. They've been found just in the sight of God. So there's suffering and there's hardship, he says, that they need to go through, that they're going to face. Well, in what he says to them there, I see, re I see uh, consolation and reassurance. The consolation is rest. You're in rest. Continue to rest. And here's your white robe. And then the reassurance. There's going to be an end. There's an end coming. We're not there yet. So it gives what he gives all of us all the time. Consolation and reassurance. Yes, exactly right. When we are in the midst of the struggle, it's hard to see that there's an end coming. But there is. It will come eventually, one way or another, some manner or another. And here's the re reason for writing the book, because there were children of God who were truly suffering. And as Nancy was just saying, here's a message of encouragement to them. Hey, everything is going to be set right in the end. God is going to make things right. He's aware of what's going on and He is going to act. And we'll read a little bit more about that hopefully here in just a minute. But today, when we have a lack of persecution, it's a problem. When our lives are so easy and we don't really face a lot of opposition in the world around us, that can be a problem. Why can that be a problem? What's that? We're blending in. Anything else? Complacency. Okay, anything else? Okay. I, I want to be very uh, blunt. If it's hard for someone to be consistent in attending worship services in our conditions, if persecution comes, you're done. You're finished. It marks out those who are truly committed from those who I like it, but I don't know. 
It's a point of clarity. In the first century, in the time that these Christians lived, you're either committed or you're not. That's what the Lord was telling them in those letters to the seven churches that, hey, I know where you stand and there's things about to unfold that's going to reveal it all. Are you really devoted to me or are you not? Rick, you have something? We're just thinking, the thing that comes to mind often is whenever there are struggles is the Christians that had to deal with going to the uh, Coliseum type places where they were put to death in a public manner. And there's history of them singing the moment being put to death. So you can only imagine trying to put yourself in that position. How much more faithful do I need to be to be that one? You know, it's right. That's a lot. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Very good. All right, let's read now verses 12 to 17, please. Revelation 6, 12 to 17. Who will read that for us? Ron. And I looked, and he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of His wrath has come, and who is able to stand? Okay. So essentially what he's talking about is this six seals opened up, is there's this great judgment against the persecuting power here. Um, you read down through this, and familiarity with the Old Testament reminds us that these types of images were brought forward when they were prophesying, when they were talking about judgment against evil nations, against Babylon, against Egypt, against Assyria, whoever it may be, there's a lot of this same type of language talking about the earth shaking, the sun being blackened, and things like that. And really the idea of the, the earth shaking, the earthquake, is the foundations are undermined. What, what undergirds everything is going to be ripped away. Uh, the sun being blackened, that which gives light, is going to be extinguished. You know, it was considered, you know, Rome was supposed to be like the light of the world, and that's that's going to be extinguished. That's going to be suffocated, if you will. And the moon turning to blood, lots of bloodshed, a lot of that imagery in different ways throughout this book. Uh, the stars falling down, the powers that are there, those things that you thought were constant, they're not constant. They, they will collapse. They will go away. Um, if you want to write this down, we're not going to chase all these references, but Isaiah chapter 13, just go read Isaiah 13 and very similar type of things being talked about regarding Babylon there. And then the, the sky being rolled up, receding like a scroll. Something you thought was not possible is going to happen. Something that's beyond our ability to comprehend. And then how do the people respond to this? How are the people going to see this in 15, 16? When the earth shakes, the sun is dark, and the moon is blood, the, the skies rolled up, the mountains <coughs> moved out of their place. They try to hide themselves in the cave or Right. And who's included in that group of people? Mighty men, rich men, commanders. What's that? Kings. Kings? Every slave and free man. Every slave and free man. Basically, he's saying from the top to the bottom of society, everybody is going to react this way. They're, they're going to be frightened out of their wits, so to speak. And what are they wanting? A quick escape. 
a quick end. They want those mountains to fall and they, they just, death is preferable to what we're going through. That's what they're saying. We, we'd rather be dead than face what we're facing right now. Now what's odd about verse 16, the latter part there? Who are they facing? Wrath of the Lamb. Okay, anybody seen the um, fainting goat videos online? Or the little, the little bitty goats that, you know, they're hopping around everywhere and they just look all cute and everything. Normally, that's how we think of a lamb. And he's putting the wrath of the lamb. We don't think of a lamb having wrath. He's saying this, this lamb has wrath. And it reminds us that our experience with God is either love or it's wrath. There's no neutrality. Either we're in God's favor or we're God's enemy and facing His retribution. So there is the wrath of the Lamb who is absolutely brutal and merciless when it comes to to executing this judgment. So what's the question that they ask? Verse 17. Who can stand? Who can stand? One answer to that is, well, no one. No one can resist this. No one can oppose this. But chapter 7 actually answers the question and tells us who can stand. Who is it that's going to actually survive this? So let's look at chapter 7. Let's read, tell you what, 1 through 4, we'll skip verses 5 through 8, as there's repetition. I think we know what's in there. But who will read Revelation 7, 1 through 4? Clint. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, that no wind might blow on the earth or sea or against any tree. Then I saw another angel descending from the rising of the sun with the seal of the living God, and he called with a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the earth and sea, saying, Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. And I heard the number of the seal, 144,000, sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. Okay, and of course he goes on to list out 12 tribes. There are some who are not mentioned there, including Dan and Ephraim. Um, there's some different theories as to why that is, that we're, we're not going to chase those. But question number five I had asked, what are the angels commanded not to do and why? They're not to harm the earth, uh, because similarly to what we saw at verse 6, they haven't been identified yet. Those who are servants of God have not been completed. Okay. He needs to mark them out. He wants His servants clearly identified. Now, here's, here's the mark of the Lamb, if you will. And of course, later in the book, we're going to have the mark of the beast. So we, we carry one mark or the other. But the Lord knows those who are His and he says, before this destruction unfolds, I want my people marked out. I want them designated to be identified so when God's powers of judgment come and sweep through the land, they know who are His. So these four angels are at the four corners of the earth and what are they holding back? Holding back wind. So, yeah, wind being a destructive force. Um, there's wind, of course, in a tornado. There's wind in a hurricane. And sometimes there's straight line winds. If you've ever been out west, they have what's called Chinook winds, where essentially the jet stream gets hooked by the mountains and pulls it down. And you could have just out on the flat land 120 mile an hour winds. And it'll blow things down. Sometimes it'll blow buildings down if they're not built right. So uh, 
this is the idea of that destructive wind coming that is being restrained, that judgment being held back. And God here is commanding these angels. And so the things that are unfolding, again, are under God's control. And they're at His timing. And He's orchestrating all of this as it unfolds. And then it talks about again, verse 2, the seal of the living God. This is similar to what's talked about in Ezekiel when it was talking about Jerusalem and the people in Jerusalem need to be marked out as the faithful ones did before Jerusalem was sacked. And you, you just simply have that idea of God knowing His people and who they are. And how many of them is it that it says are marked? Verse 4. And then it talks about 12,000 this tribe, 12,000, 12,000. 12, what, what is that talking about? Why 144? So, the, the, the completeness of uh, trying to be something to do with completeness of all the. Okay. The okay. So, what, <laughs> what do we say about. You know, the numbers have symbolism. So let's break it down to 144. How do you get 144 from the numbers that we've discussed before? 12 times 12. 12, 12 representing what? 12 tribes, of Israel, 12, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles, right? So 12 represents God's people, really. So in, in a, a totality, so you have 12 and 12, 144, then how do you get to 144,000? Do I? 12,000 times 12. Okay, you can do 12,000 times 12. 12 times 12 times 10 times 10 times 10. Right? If you break it down to those base numbers that keep showing up in the book. So it's the totality of God's people times 10 times 10 times 10. In other words, it's just simply representing all of God's people. It's not saying it's limited to 144,000. Which, you know, some people get hung up on that number and think, well, that's, that's actually a fixed number. It's a symbolic number to represent the totality. The latter part of the chapter, the great multitude really is the same as this 144,000. It's just showing all that multitude as opposed to giving that representative number, if you will. So the totality of God's people on earth, not one of them is going to be missed. And that's the point he's really trying to convey to these people I am not overlooking anyone who's faithful. All of you will be marked out as my faithful children. Any other thoughts there? Alright. So escaping judgment means that we have to be marked out as God's people. Not being ashamed to be identified with God's people. Not being ashamed to live by God's way. Not being afraid of what men will say or do to us because of our faith in God. We need to be distinct from the culture around us. Distinct from the false religion that is around us. Because if we blend in, that means we're not being marked with the seal of the living God. We'll be marked with the mark of the beast, if you will. All right. 9 through 17, let's read those. Who will get that for us? Elijah Dean. After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, <clears throat> which no one could number, of all the nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, <clears throat> with palm branches in their hands, and crying out with a loud voice, saying, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and the elders, and the four living creatures, and fell on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom, thanksgiving and honor, power and might, be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Through 17, in the chapter. Then one of the elders answered, saying to me, Who are these arrayed in white robes, and where did they come from? And I say to him, Sir, you know... So he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. 
Therefore they are behold the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. He who sits on the throne will dwell among them. They shall neither hunger any more nor thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them nor any heat. For the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to the living fountains of water. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Okay. So here's that picture of those who've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Uh, multitude from all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues. Does that remind you of anything? Okay, in Acts 2 it talks about men from every nation under heaven. Going to all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. How about back at Abraham's promise? What was he promised? All nations. All families ought to be blessed through your seed. So, yeah, it's, it's reflecting on that. It's picking up on that idea. Um, and it talks about them holding palm branches. Does that ring a bell with you on anything? What's that? When Jesus comes into Jerusalem. When He came into Jerusalem, they were laying the palm branches down exactly right. And you also have this Feast of Tabernacles that had the palm branches and things involved with it and basically it was a celebration of them of God being with them leading them through the wilderness God's leading these people through the wilderness right now so to speak and that's the idea you've led us through the wilderness you have redeemed us you have delivered us into that promised land if you will now John is asked a question verse 13 who are these arrayed in white robes and where did they come from? What's John's answer to that? John doesn't answer the question. And John doesn't ask any questions in the book, which is interesting. And you would think if he saw this, he'd be like, what's that? What's that? But he didn't, there's no record of him asking a question. Here, the question is asked of him, and he defers. And you know who they are. And so then the angel answers, or rather one of the elders answers, and says, these are those who have come out of the great tribulation, washed their robes, so that it's the faithful. And the, the time of this great tribulation, if we, if we look at the history of what's unfolded, it, it's really from the time of Nero all the way up to the time of Constantine when he put an end to the empire or imperial persecution. So it's that time period, if you will, of those who had served the Lord and gone, had gone through all this persecution. And it says that they are before the throne of God, verse 15, when? Day and night. They're in God's presence day and night, forever and ever is the idea. They are in full fellowship with God. And anything that unfolds in the persecution is not going to affect their relationship with God. It's not going to impact that relationship. They're, they're going to face suffering. Those who are on the earth, they're going to face suffering. But they're going to get through that suffering and be in the presence of God. That suffering is not the persecution isn't going to affect it. The devil cannot force them to abandon God. They can only voluntarily give that up. And so if they'll remain committed and faithful, they'll be before the throne of God in His presence forever and ever. Alright, any other thoughts before we jump over to chapter 8? Or into chapter 8. Alright, let's read Revelation 8, 1 through 5, please. We'll get that for us. Top. When the Lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about, a half, for about a half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel came and stood at the altar, holding a golden censer, and much incense was given to him, so that he might add it to the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints went up before God out of the angel's hand. 
Then the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and threw it into the earth. And there followed pearls of thunder and sounds of flashes of lightning and an earthquake. Okay. So you have this great scene unfolding. You you go from the throne scene in chapter five, the lamb, or rather chapter four, the lamb, chapter five, chapter six, these horsemen coming out, these seals being opened up, all these things going on, then there's a half hour of silence. Why? Is it the idea of serious thinking and preparation for what's about to happen? What they're there for now? Um, Is it kind of like the calm before the storm? Is it like the sea line? uh, See, y'all can't stand it. Pause. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it's, it's a dramatic pause. And we, we can't go 30 seconds without talking. This is 30 minutes of silence. It's building that anticipation. Imagine how unnerved you would be there with all those things going on, then silence for 30 minutes. It's hard for us to sit at home in silence for 30 minutes. You know, we, we want something going on. So exactly right. There, there's a pause here. There, it, and it, it's, it's, it's helping that focus to come in on what's about to be unleashed. What's about to be revealed here. So, the seven angels, they're given seven trumpets here. Uh, what are trumpets used for? Going back to the Old Testament. Sounding alarms or... They're sounding the alarm. There's war. They're used in war to signal things. Announcing a proclamation. Announcing a proclamation. There's, it's associated with worship at times. There's the beast of trumpets, right? So there's various uses, but you, you kind of see those different things blending in here. There's, there's a warning and there's war that is coming here. So you got the sound of the trumpets. Um, so you've got the angel. He has a golden censer. And what's in that golden censer? What's happening with it? Coals. Okay, there's coals. <laughs> yeah, the incense, which is the prayers being offered up with the prayers of the saints. Um, and for some reason I didn't write this question down and I know there's a question there. It's question six, six on the lesson sheet. What's, what's the question? Anybody? The nature of the prayers and the meaning of the censor being thrown down the earth. Yes. What, what is, what's going on here? These Prayers going up to God with that censer, that censer then having fire put in and thrown to the earth. Stephen, could the prayers be what we were reading about in the sixth chapter, asking God how long will this be before judgment comes upon them? And so now we see God's judgment is coming as he casts the censer onto the earth. Right, exactly. Andrew, anything to add? Right, exactly. Time's up. This 30-minute pause is over. Intermission is done, if you will. And the prayers have gone up. Lord, how long? And boom. He's striking now. One thing that I really interesting here is this is the, the introduction that we get to the seventh seal is that 30-minute pause. And then the first thing we see immediately after that is what we can only relate back to the, the prayers of the saints under the altar. And they're their request for vengeance, if you will. But it's interesting to me that that 30-minute pause takes place first, as similar to what we would do on an event like such as 9-11. Mm-hmm. Um, we have that, that pause where we stop to think about the, the things that have been done, the lives that have been lost, the memorial of those people that died unnecessarily. And this is 
kind of where I see everything, the tribulation is complete, if you will. And now it's time to remember those saints that run to the altar and then act on the prayers that they sent up. Yeah, God's allowed that time to go by unanswered, but now He's acting. Now He's acting. Very good. So you, you've got the, the trumpets, the, the angels with these trumpets, they, they begin to sound the trumpets as this unfolds down through uh, the chapter. Um, when the Lord responds in these trumpets, I don't know if you noticed this as you went down through it, Yes, for that. Um, it's also kind of a callback to when they attacked Jericho, which you had seven priests blowing seven trumpets right before they used to do the second attack. Yes. You see echoes of both the attack on Jericho and echoes of the ten plagues. Not direct parallel, but there's a lot of similarity in here. And so again, when, when we read in the book of Revelation, it's not the fulfillment really of an Old Testament prophecy about X, Y, and Z happening, though there is a little bit of that that we'll talk about later, but it's picking up on historic events and the language that the prophets used and it's applying it here in this situation. And so it's very interesting to see. Uh, allowing the people that were reading this to understand by knowing what went on in the Old Testament. Basically. Exactly. They, they understood the language of the Old Testament, so therefore they understood it. Right, right, exactly right. And when you see God's response in these trumpets and what happens, is he, just like in the plagues of Egypt, he showed his superiority over the gods of Egypt and over Pharaoh, he's showing his superiority over the gods of the Romans and over their Caesar, over their ruler, whoever that might have been at a particular time. So he's expressing his superiority and power over them. All right, so let's jump down now, verses 6 through 13. Who will read that for us? Revelation 8, 6 through 13. Andrew. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded, and hail and fire followed, mingled with blood, and they were thrown to the earth. And a third of the trees were burned, and all green grass was burned up. And the second angel sounded, and something like a great mountain burned with fire it was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood. And a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Then the third angel sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many men died from the water because it was made bitter. Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, likewise the night. And I looked, and I heard an angel flying in the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth, because of the remaining blast of the trumpet and the three angels who are about to sound. All right, very well. So this first angel, and what happens with him, where is the judgment directed against what thing? against the earth, the, the trees and the grass. Okay. Yeah, notice that each of these is, is specific about what it's affecting, what it's impacting. So the earth, the land, the trees, the, the green things. So it's, this is like a, a land-based judgment, if you will. And what is it that's coming down? Verse 7. Hail. Hail. And fire, what does that remind you of? What's that? I'm missing it. Okay. I'm, I am slightly hard of hearing. 
And so if you, you speak very loud, very clear, like your child's misbehaving on the other end of the store, if you'll do that, it'll, it'll help me out. But, but what, the hell and fire. Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay, there's Sodom and Gomorrah maybe, a fire and brimstone coming down. Egypt. 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 The hail that came and the lightning that came, which very often lightning fire from the sky is associated uh, together. There's hail that came down. That, remember when the sun stood still, the moon stood still. There's hail that came down on the enemies of God. So th this is the idea of God using these elements to bring judgment. But the hail and the fire mingled with what? Blood. Blood. Now, if hail and fire are coming down and blood is with them, what blood do you think that is? Because once it hits, it could... If it's on the ground, it could be the blood of the people it's killing. But if it's coming mingled with blood, what blood is that? It could be the blood of the Lamb or, or the blood of the saints. This is the reason for that judgment is because they've shed the blood of the saints there. So, yeah, this is God's vengeance coming against them. And what can we learn about this idea of the third of the trees are burned up? Grass burned up. A third. It's not everything. It's a partial judgment. And it's not the final judgment. Alright, so the second angel. What's his judgment directed toward? Sea. Sea. Ocean. Right. Saltwater areas. And when it talks about that third of the ocean, what in verse 9, of course, the sea became blood. It reminds you of the waters of Egypt becoming blood, right? So it says that living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. What, what does that have to do with? The plus was the one Okay. So you have these creatures dying. Let me ask you something. Rome is located where? Near. near. It's, it's on a big peninsula. Uh, to your question earlier, is this a, having a direct effect on their commerce and on, on their means of gaining income? And, economic performance. Exactly. When you talk about a third, the Rome depended greatly on seafaring for shipping goods, especially bringing in grain and wheat and everything like that, but a lot of other stuff. So a third of the ships being destroyed, that'd be a problem. And then a third of the sea creatures dying, that's a source of food as well as income for them. Being a peninsula, living on a peninsula, you know, seafood, fish was a huge staple in their diet. So it, it's hitting the commerce, it's hitting the food. It talks about this mountain into the sea and it says this great burning with fire mountain. What does that remind you of? What, what do you think of when you think of a burning mountain? Volcano. Okay. This is roughly 96 A.D. thereabouts. What happened about 15, 16 years or so before? Vesuvius. Okay. So, Vesuvius and the death and destruction that brought was as fresh or fresher in their minds than 9-11 is in our minds. Right? There's a good number of us. 9-11, we think of it, we, we feel it. Right? So this would strike fear into them about what is happening here. This volcanic eruption and throwing into the sea and the death and destruction that comes along with that. Alright. 10-11, um, third angel. We just have to, to move on here real quick. What's it directed against? The judgment. Fresh water. Okay, fresh water. Exactly right. 
So the life-sustaining water, and what happens with this? First time you see that people are dying. Okay, people are dying, and what what is it that hits the water? Great star. Okay, yeah, this great star. And very often in prophetic or apocalyptic literature, a great star represents a great power that is fallen. And when that great power falls, here's what then unfolds. Uh, a third, it talks about it became wormwood. A third of the rivers and the springs of the waters were affected and it became wormwood. What is wormwood? In my version, it says that's the name of the star. Okay. What does that mean, though? Poison. Exactly. It's the idea of poison. It was a bit, something bitter to eat, and if it was in water and you drank it over time, it could cause death. And so that's, that's what's being conveyed here. This life-sustaining resource actually becomes a source of death to the people. And it was very often in the Old Testament associated with idolatry that idea of wormwood, of that idolatry being corrupting and poisonous and bringing death upon people. The fourth angel then, verses 12 and 13, what's the fourth angel sound against and what happens? All of the sources of light. Okay, those sources of light, those heavenly bodies that are up there, that again you think of as being constant, of being reliable, of being almost eternal in their nature. Those things that are being there and then this darkness comes over. Of course, what does that echo? Egypt. Darkness came over the land. So this darkness is falling over the land. Um, Darkness usually is associated with the idea of, of knowledge. You know, light is knowledge, darkness is lack of knowledge. So this, this thing that gave light is not there anymore. Uh, some have associated this with like the light of the gospel being covered with this evil or the light of Rome being put out, if you will. So you've got that happening. And then there is in verse 13, what's going on? In the New King James, it says he heard an angel. Does anybody have the King James or a footnote? Eagle. Yeah, an eagle. Eagle's probably the, the better translation there. But um, what's that eagle doing? And he says, whoa, 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 there's three woes. We'll see those unfold. But what, what's interesting about what he says? Woe to all the earth because why? As if what happened wasn't bad already, there's even worse to come. So in these trumpet blasts, in these things, and, and we see this going forward here, God's trying to get people to wake up. He's trying to get His children. Remember in the seven churches of Asia, if there were most of those, that He said, you've got something you have to fix. And so He's calling men to turn back to Him, to wake up, to realize what's going on. These partial judgments that are coming down. And just to fast forward, if you will, to us make a modern day application, you know, what's going on in our nation? These events that happen, whether it's riots that are going on or the economy being tanked or whatever's happening, let's understand God's hand is working in the world and when disasters come, it's intended to wake us up and make us to realize we need to be right with God and living faithfully for Him because these are partial judgments there's a final judgment that's coming. And we need to be ready for that. Alright, Lord willing, 
chapters 9, 10, and 11 next week. 9, 10, and 11.